We talked a little bit as we began about the value of clear thinking and that if you exercise or develop this uh, as a personal skill, if you have some of the tools that help you to do that, you'll begin to see things that you didn't ever see before and you'll be able to play at the game. And that's a good thing because the game here is the game of truth and that's vitally important. Uh, and there are some belief systems around nowadays that are working against you and even attempting to learn to, to play the game well. And that belief system, broadly speaking, is postmodernism or radical relativism. And I talked about why I didn't think postmodernism was a good idea, why I thought it was, in fact, a, a bad idea in the sense that it's not true. Um, and I don't think it's even possible for it to be true because the foundational tenets are self-refuting. I don't have to refute it. They, re they refute themselves. And then we talked about how to build an argument, that arguments are different from assertions. They are points of view with reasons. And that if you're having discussion with something, someone about matters of fact, don't settle for just hearing their opinion. Ask them to give reasons why you ought to take their opinion seriously. Ask essentially what's the argument. And you can do this on your own, too, when you're watching TV and some news show or hearing some discussion or reading some piece in the paper or a magazine and people are making particular points, ask, excuse me, what is the argument? And is the argument that they're giving, once you can flesh it out and see it clearly, does it work? Because arguments can go bad in a number of different ways. One way that they go bad is that they aren't really arguments at all. They are just fancy assertions. We talked about phantom arguments. We talked about illustrations being offered as arguments. We talked about bedtime stories where people just conjure up explanations and then expect you to refute them when they haven't said anything at that point worthy of refuting. The burden is on them to give the, uh, the evidence if they're the ones that are making the claim. Uh, sometimes you have true arguments where reasons are given in support of a point of view. But the arguments go bad because either the form of the argument is wrong, the conclusion doesn't follow naturally, you have a non sequitur, the conclusion doesn't follow naturally from the, from the, the, the earlier premises. Uh, it could go wrong not in the form but in the facts. And there the, the form is right, so it's a valid argument, but the facts are not correct, so it's not sound. And even when you have something that looks like it's valid and the facts look like they're right, there could be confusion if the terms are not used in the same way. And so when you have equivocation and two, two, uh, one word is used with two different definitions to create confusion, um, then the argument or the point of view can go sour as well. And we talked about some examples of that. Now there's another way in the, in the process of, of, of trying to enter into the, um, I talk about the, playing the game, I, and I, in one sense it's not a game, clear thinking, because so much is at stake, but in, in another sense it is a game in that it's an activity that follows certain rules and could be fun to play it if you play it well. Um, one of the things in the game is seeing False appeals, or appeals that have rhetorical force, emotional impact, they can, they can persuade people to a point of view, but they're not sound, they're not sensible, they're not good ones. And generally these are called informal fallacies, I call them think bombs. And we're going to talk about, I think, six of them, like before, briefly. And again, my apologies for going so quickly through them. But if you can get a handle on some of these basic ideas and some of the illustrations resonate with you, you may get some things in your hand that you can begin using um, in, the, um, in the game of clear thinking, as it were. And the first, and I'm choosing fallacies, informal fallacies here, that I think that are the kind of things that I run into as a Christian apologist. As an individual Christian who takes the Christian message seriously enough to want to carefully explain it, to other people and to persuade them that it's actually true. And when I'm in the process of doing that, either in a private fashion or in a public fashion, I run into certain type of illicit um, arguments, so to speak, or ways of dealing with my point of view, and I want to unmask these things. A quick question for the sound man. I'm getting a little wind over my mic here, and if that's not bothering you, it's all right with me. If it does create a problem, then we probably need to <laughs> close the window. I don't know, or can I change the fan? <laughs> Leave the window open. <laughs> yeah, if you want to move it that way, thank you very much. 
The first thing that I run into all the time is a fallacy called ad hominem. A-D? H-O-M-I-N-E-M. -E I think that's the right way to spell it. That's the way it's usually referred to. The simple way of naming it is name calling. <laughs> An ad hominem fallacy is when someone diverts the attention from the real issue by attacking the person in an irrelevant way. Ad hominem means to the man or to the person. And so when you're having certain types of discussions, lots of the time the, dis the issue will be uh, clouded and one will be diverted from the real issue because of attacks on the individual that are involved. You say, well, Jesus is the only way. Well, that's arrogant. Christians are arrogant because they believe the, their view is right. Now, that's not a, a substantive response, ladies and gentlemen. That's a, an attack on the person's character that is unrelated to the issue at hand. The question in this discussion, is Jesus the only way? Well, it's either true or false, and it's true or false regardless if people are, are, are arrogant or not. It may be that in saying that, I am arrogant. It may be that I'm very humble when I say that. The point is, my arrogance or humility has nothing to do with whether, whether the, the statement that I've made, that Jesus is the only way to salvation, is either true or false. That's a statement about me, not about the issue at hand. And it's, it, it's also fair to say, I think it's an inappropriate response, because Christians, as far as I can tell, don't mean that arrogantly when they say that Jesus is the only way. After all, it's not my point of view. I'd change that if I could. That was Jesus' point of view. Now, if you want to call Jesus arrogant, well, that's another story, but I'll tell you a secret. Jesus had the goods. This was a guy with credibility, so he could get away with things like that because there are good reasons to believe that Jesus was the kind of guy who knew a few things about the spiritual realm, and it seems that he demonstrated that with his life. In any event, that's his claim, not my claim. I'm just re representing it as his because I think he was right in that claim. It's funny, too, when people say, well, you're arrogant because you believe that. I said, do you think I'm wrong? Yeah. And your view is right? Yeah. Well, how come I'm arrogant when I think I'm right, but when you think you're right, you're just right, not arrogant? And that kind of response points out that this is simple name-calling. Uh, and it's good to keep in mind, and you might even write this down. This is a nice handy one to have in your back pocket. Ridicule is not an argument. I like that. People make fun of you, everybody laughing at you. Well, ridicule is not an argument. You want to ridicule me, make fun of me, go ahead. You can do that all you want, but don't mistake that for saying something meaningful about the issue. That's little, that's name calling. I get on the radio, talk about homosexuality, people call me homophobe. Here's a way, a great tactic in dealing with name calling. They call you homophobe, they may call you racist, they may call you bigot. Simple way of dealing it. You ask for a definition. What does that mean? You're a homophobe. What does that mean? I mean, I'm curious, what does that mean in their, in their mind? Does it mean that I'm afraid of homosexuals? Well, I'm not afraid of homosexuals, and there's nothing that I've said that have indicated that. I don't know why you'd conclude that. It turns out that homophobe is not a fear of homosexuals. It's just a way for people to label you if you disagree with them, all it is is simple name calling. And it'd be fair to say, look, you know, we talk about this issue, and, um, and I give my point of view. When I give my point of view, all you do is call me a name. I had a guy call me on the air, and we were discussing this issue, and, and, uh, and I, I, uh, he just simply called me a homophobe. And he was a homosexual. And I said, you know, um, I didn't call you a faggot. I didn't call you a queer or a fairy. I don't believe in that kind of thing, and I don't. I don't allow that on my show. I do not allow any of that kind of stuff on my show because it's not appropriate. Homosexuals are still human beings made in the image of God, and they des deserve our respect as human beings just like anyone else. But by the, sa by the same token, I, since I treat him with respect, I expect him to treat me with respect. <clears throat> and I pointed out if I am not going to call him names, he shouldn't be calling me names. And if he had something to say that was meaningful and productive about the issue of homosexuality, I'm glad to hear it. But if all he wants to do is, is sit there and call me names, he can get off the phone, and I'll talk to somebody on the air that's willing to discuss this in an intelligent fashion. 
And what, what was done there is I identified the mere tactic of name calling ad hominem. I called it what it was. And I said, basically, shame on you for doing that. And I want you to be able to recognize when people do this. I, uh, you know, when uh, the Ellen DeGeneres came out, so to speak, in her TV show last year, there were a lot of articles about it. And Jerry Falwell had made a comment, which I wish he hadn't made, because I think it was, it was inappropriate or real-timed uh, and certainly you know, misunderstood, I think, when he called Ellen DeGeneres, Ellen DeGenerate. Now, some people saw that as a simple ad hominem. In his case, I don't think it was. Sometimes an attack on a person is not an attack on a person that, is, that, that distracts somebody from the argument at hand. That's, that's an ad hominem. You call somebody, oh, you're stupid. What do you know? You're dumb. In the abortion argument, you're a man. What do you know? When uh, Dr. Beckwith was faced with this in a forum, he said, well, ma'am, uh, arguments don't have testicles, so I don't see why uh, me being a man has anything to do with the discussion at hand. Which is a good point. He may be a man, but what does that have to do with wh whether babies are being killed by abortion or not? One time he was said, a woman said, you're so insensitive. You, you're, you're insensitive to the plight of women. He said, yeah, I, maybe, I, maybe I am. Maybe I'm the nastiest, meanest guy around. But what does that have to do with whether babies are being killed with abortion or not? And see, what he's done is he's identified the ad hominem, and he has diffused it by calling it what it was, in a rather clever way, I might add. When one guy called him a homophobe, he said, what is a phobia? What is a, homo what is a phobia? Phobia is kind of like an irrational fear. People that have phobias are sick, right? When you call me a, 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 a homophobe, you're, you're making fun of my phobia. You're making fun of my irrational fear. It's like a handicap. You're making fun of my handicap. He said, you're more politically incorrect than I am, you know. So um, anyway, when I, I read a, a, a newspaper article, Howard, Howard Rosenberg of the LA Times, uh, wrote about the comment that Jerry Falwell had made. And um, in Falwell's case, I don't think he was giving an ad hominem. I think he was giving a character assessment, which is different. But it wasn't, he, it wasn't very deftly done in Mr. Falwell's case, and so he invited ridicule. Can this wait for a little bit? OK, thanks. Um, here's what Rosenberg wrote in response to Mr. Falwell, who he thought was guilty of calling names. I quote, you may have missed the latest blast of anti-gay bigotry from the great wit, the Reverend Jerry Falwell. He was probably wearing his usual frozen smile when he delivered that infantile slur titling DeGeneres Ellen Degenerate. Now, I don't know if you noticed this, but in this complaint against Jerry Falwell for his name calling, there was a, a, prof, a, a, a profusion of name calling. What is this phony, sm this frozen smile business? Well, it's to imply that he's really a phony because he's got a frozen smile on his face. He's a, a bigot. He's a homophobe. He's, a, an infant, he's infantile in his slur. Notice that none of these comments have anything to do with the, the appropriateness of a homosexual coming out on TV, which was the issue at hand. This was simple ad hominem name calling. There is a variation of the uh, ad hominem called a circumstantial ad hominem in which you attack the circumstances the individual is in who is giving an argument to discredit the argument. And so people will say, well, uh, on, on whether the New Testament is historically reliable or not, they say, well, it was written by Christians. So Christians are in the circumstance that is questionable in their mind. They're necessarily biased, and therefore it can't be true. Well, just because the New Testament is written by Christians doesn't mean that it's all false which is what the presumption is. And there is an attack on the individual involved or the circumstances of the individual to discredit the point that's being made. So keep your eyes open for an ad hominem attack or simple name calling. And when there is simple name calling, and sometimes it's not quite so simple in the sense that it's real obvious, sometimes it's more subtle, like you're a man. What do you know about abortion? I mean, that has a lot of rhetorical power when uttered in the right circumstance. And if you see it and you call it what it is, as Dr. Beckwith did, then you're able to diffuse it. But if you don't see it, you don't call it what it is, people uh, will, will use those techniques to get tremendous advantage over you. Ad hominem, name calling. Second one. Let me write these down for you just so. One, name calling. The second one that I see uh, come up all of the time is what's called a category 
error. A category error. That's our second think bomb. And a category error is when someone asks a question about a thing that doesn't properly apply to that thing. If I asked you, what does the color blue taste like? You're going to have a hard time answering that question. And the reason you're going to have a hard time answering that question is because colors don't have tastes. It's what's called a category error. This occurs a lot in religious discussion, especially when one's talking about the existence of God based on the existence of the universe. When you argue that since there is the existence of the cosmos, there must be a God behind it to create the cosmos, those are called cosmological arguments. The existence of a thing indicates the existence, or I said the, the existence of the effect of the universe points to God as the cause. And people will then say, aha, I've got you, Christian. What caused God? Where did God come from? That's an example of a category error. Because cosmological arguments are constructed in such a way as to point to the necessary existence of something that itself is the ground of being or the first thing before which there is none other. And so when somebody says, okay, you've made your case for God, now what caused God? There you go. They're asking a question about God that doesn't properly apply to God. Because God is the kind of being that is a being without cause. There is nothing before him. It's like saying, what came before the beginning? Well, nothing becomes before the beginning, or that thing wouldn't be the beginning. The thing that came before it would be. You see, it's a category error, asking the wrong kind of questions. Now, there have been times, though, when I've offered cosmological arguments, and people say, well, look, at you, you're cheating now because you assert that the universe must have a beginning, and now you assert that God doesn't need a beginning. That's contradictory. The problem with that objection is, first of all, I didn't assert the, that the universe had a beginning. I gave an argument for it, and there's a difference, as we learned last hour. And what my argument entailed is, is that the universe is the kind of thing, as we discover it, that requires a beginning. And in fact, scientific evidence that we have shows that it did, in fact, have a beginning. So then it becomes appropriate to ask what caused it. But there's nothing that we know about, at least the concept of God as we're discussing, that requires that God be caused or be born or come into being or anything like that. So that contradiction that they think they're pointing out really doesn't, doesn't apply to my argument. So when somebody says, well, what caused God? That's an example of a category error. It comes up in other cases, too, where you try to ascribe natural processes to non-natural things. In Time magazine two years ago, make that three years ago, July 17, 1995, three years and two weeks, they did a cover story on consciousness, and they explored what consciousness is and they were talking about what's known in philosophical circles as the mind-body problem. Are human beings just a physical body, or is there a soul in there that directs things? Now, Christianity teaches a dualism, body and soul. And this article repudiated that, and here is the reasoning that they offered. We don't know what consciousness is, but one thing we know that it's not. There is no someone inside your body that is directing how the body works. There's no soul, okay? At this point, that's, a, that's a, um, an assertion. Now, what's their justification? Comes in the next couple sentences. How do we know this? We know that there's no souls because scientists have been looking for it for 100 years and haven't found it. And then they added, and there's no place in the brain for it to fit. Now, think about that for just a moment. There's no place place in the brain for the soul to fit. That's like saying, you know, you told me there was an invisible man in your house, and I went in there, and I looked all around, and I didn't see him. So therefore, there's no invisible man in the house. Well, wait a minute. If there's an invisible man in the house, you're not going to find that out by looking for him. That's what it means to be invisible. And if human beings possess a soul, or are possessed of a soul, then a soul is not, by its very nature, the kind of thing science. And if souls being immaterial things can't be examined by science, guess what science can't do? It can't prove they don't exist. 
it is not capable of doing so. That is a what? Category error. You don't use a mechanism to determine physical realities to disprove the existence of a non-physical thing. It can't be done. It's nonsense. But here was Time Magazine, July 17, 1995, that announced to the world, it's, it's, it's monumental, and I don't mean this in an unkind way, but I mean it accurately, it's monumental ignorance. There was no place in the brain for it to fit. That's like saying human beings can't be in love. Why not? Well, science has looked for that love thing all over the place. Can't find it. There is no love. In fact, uh, the bigger problem is when people say they're in love, you know, or they, they have love in their heart, we looked at hearts. We got cardiologists that look at every single heart, and they never found any love in any hearts. Therefore, love doesn't exist. See the problem with the category error. That's the same problem with people saying, well, science has proved that there are no miracles. This is false, ladies and gentlemen. Science has not proven that there are no miracles. Not only has science not proven such, but science is not capable of doing that. Science can only prove, if it can prove anything, it only can prove physical realities. It can't say anything directly about the nature of the non-physical realm. I'm going to have to apologize. I can't take questions until this evening, just because of the, the time that, that's involved here. So when somebody says that science has disproved miracles, I'm going to want to ask, how is that possible? Explain to me how, what scientific tests proved that miracles aren't possible. Now, it may be the case that one alleged miracle is disproved because there is a naturalistic explanation that is better than the miraculous explanation. But all that's happened is they've shown that that particular claim on miracle is not a good claim. They haven't proven that miracles don't happen. And so when people like... Um, uh, Joseph Campbell, the power of myth, can say something like, in this modern age, no intelligent person can believe in miracles, and therefore all miracles and religious accounts must be myths. I want to ask, what does this age have to say about whether miracles can or cannot happen? What does intelligence have to do with whether one believes that a miracle can, in fact, take place? In fact, neither are true. It has nothing to do with the modern age or intelligence, but it does have a lot to do with a philosophical point of view that simply disqualifies the possibility of miracles. That isn't science, though. Science isn't capable of doing that. Not science, the methodology. Um, the next one is the genetic fallacy. The genetic fallacy. By the way, I want to say just a word about bias here because it kind of relates some of these things. Um, people claim that Christians have biases when it comes to this kind of thing like science and evolution. Well, you Christians are biased. Dr. Moreland has pointed out that bias um, operates in a different way in, in the Christian on these issues than with the non-Christian. You see, as a Christian, my worldview, I am biased to have a much more expansive worldview than, uh, than a non-Christian. Because I believe in the physical realm and that it operates according to physical laws. And I believe in, an, in a non-physical realm that can impede on the physical realm in certain ways. In fact, I'm doing it now because my soul is moving my body. The non-physical realm moving the physical realm. <clears throat> but a non-Christian, uh, 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 especially one that, are, that, that hold to a materialistic worldview... Um, is limited in the, the options. They believe in natural laws, and that's it. And so their bias limits the possible options they can, they can uh, conclusions they can come to when faced with certain evidence, where my bias expands it. My bias is a good bias in this regard, because when, come, when I come to any particular phenomenon, I have the liberty to follow the evidence where it leads. I, it could lead to evolution if the a uh, naturalistic explanation if the evidence is good, but it can also lead to design and special creation if the, evolution, if the evidence indicates that too. A materialist can't do that. His bias says he can only have one kind of answer, and he's restricted even if the evidence isn't good for that answer. So bias really works in favor of the Christian in opening up the categories and, and allowing him to find out what is actually true, where the bias uh, on the materialist side closes the categories and disallows options. Genetic fallacy. Genetic fallacy is when you attack the merit of a point of view based merely on its source or origin. You attack the merit of a point of view based merely on its source or origin. 
Remember, was it Philip who said, can any good thing come from Nazareth? Well, that's an example of the genetic fallacy. One of the most common ways that this is manifest is when uh, Freud and Feuerbach and, um, and other Nietzsche, uh, Marx, picked on religion as a kind of opiate of the people. Well, you Christians just want a father figure. You need to have something that makes you feel better about the universe because you don't want to feel alone. Christianity, in that sense, is a crutch to make you feel better. Notice that this objection is an objection that is focused at the psychological motivations for believing something. They are faulting the truthfulness of Christianity based on its genesis, where it comes from, the psychological motivations inside an individual, and thus they're, they're, um, they're guilty of the genetic fallacy. How so? You know, it may be the case that I believe in Christianity because I'm really weak, that I need a crutch, that I can't hand rea handle reality without believing in a God. But what does that fact have to do with whether God exists or not and whether Christianity is true or not? You see, my psychological motivations for believing something have nothing to do with the, the truthfulness or falsehood of the thing itself. And psycho examining somebody's psychological state of mind is, is helpful only after you've, you've established on independent grounds that their views are wrong. It's helpful if you can demonstrate that Christianity is false in its own merits, and then afterwards say, why would somebody believe a thing like that since it is false? Why would they be motivated to believe it? Then you can ask that question. But if you are simply dis, uh, dismissing a point of view because of the psychological reason somebody might have of doing so, of, of believing it, that's the genetic fallacy. Somebody asked me today, why would a postmodernist believe postmodernism when, when, when you think it's so silly? And I gave some of my reasons. But I was careful to point out that I don't think postmodernism is false because postmodernists have psychological reasons to hold that truth is relative. I, am, I first made a case against postmodernism. And having done so, then I thought, if postmodernism is false, then why would people believe it? And I think there are reasons why people might engage it that are principally moral reasons. It uh, supports their own sense of autonomy. But I don't use that as a sole critique of, of postmodernism. Uh, uh, C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said, you must show that a person is wrong before you can, it's, it's meaningful to ask why he's wrong. What psychological motivations might have driven him to his faulty conclusion? Uh, by, by the way, Christians make the same error. Uh, there's a, a, a movement in the church now that's quite hostile to psychology. And one of the ways that they make their point is they look at Freud. Freud hated God. All of these guys who are psychologists, these Freud and uh, all these others, they, they just, they were radically non-Christian. So we should have anything to do with their teaching. Well, uh, they may, might have been radically non-Christian, but you see, if you hold that as a, a refutation of their ideas, then you're guilty of the genetic fallacy. It's quite possible for Sigmund Freud, who was a radical non-Christian apparently, to make some accurate observations about human beings and about human neuroses or something. You can't simply dismiss it because of the source. Um, you believe Christianity because you were born in America. Same thing. Well, maybe I do believe Christianity because I was born in America. But that doesn't mean Christianity is false to believe on its own merits. See how that works? Genetic fallacy. All right, let's try another one. You with me so far? No, yes, maybe so. Okay, by the tape. C.S. Lewis quote, and this comes in the book God in the Dock, if you have it, under the chapter called Bulverism, and he deals with this issue in that chapter. He says, you must show that a man is wrong before you start explaining why he is wrong. It's a good line, isn't it? It's memorable. C.S. Lewis. Fourth, circular reasoning Or begging the question, and I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I'll explain what it is. Circular reasoning or begging the question. A, a circular reasoning is when you assume a truth 
you then deduce a conclusion, and then you use the conclusion to prove that the original assumption was true. Uh, it, 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 you're, you're, you're basically, in circular reasoning, you're assuming as true the very thing that you're trying to prove. Assuming as true the very thing you're trying to prove. And that's part of your proof. Um, the Bible is the word of God. How do you know the Bible's word of God? Because the Bible says it is, and God wouldn't lie. Well, do you know, notice how they believe that the Bible is the word of God because God wouldn't lie, but it's their conclusion is that the Bible is the word of God, but they have to assume that it's God's word before they can make their case. So they're assuming it's God's word to prove that it's God's word, circular reasoning. Uh, begging the question is assuming without proof the truth or falsity of a pointed issue. It's a variation of this. I was listening to, uh, uh, to the, um, I read the LA Times the other day, and apparently there's a, a big squawk now. The EPA is under attack by a judge, Environmental Protect Protection Agency, about secondhand smoke. Did you read the articles about this? All this brouhaha about secondhand smoke, and in some states, including this one, I guess, you can't even smoke. I thought I heard you can't even smoke outside. In this state, or maybe, maybe it's a, in Boulder City, you can't smoke outside even. But there's all these restrictions because of the dangers of secondhand smoke. And now it turns out the judge says that the EPA uh, report was very faulty, and uh, secondhand smoke is not a carcinogen. And so there's this big brouhaha about it because it draws into question all of these laws that were made based on this research. And the talk show hosts, uh, the radio talk show hosts in Los Angeles, are all up in arms at what the what the uh, what the judges said. And what they said was, this judge is irresponsible because he's not paying attention to the facts. He's saying that the EPA is all wrong, but the facts are that secondhand smoke does cause cancer. Now, this is a classic example of circular reasoning. Why is the judge wrong in talking about this? Because he's not paying attention to the facts. But what's at issue? The very thing that is at issue is the nature of the facts themselves. And the judge's case is, is that the facts that the EPA have offered are not facts at all, but distortions. So there's a case where just in the last week this kind of circular reasoning has come up. Uh, I don't have more time to, to pursue that, uh, it, but it, it is not uncommon for people in the process of trying to defend their point of view to assume the truthfulness of their point of view in, uh, in their defense, and that's called circular reasoning or question begging. We've got... Uh, Couple more here. Five. Naturalistic fallacy. The naturalistic fallacy. <clears throat> the naturalistic fallacy is very simple. It's drawing a moral conclusion from a mere description of the way things are. It's drawing a moral conclusion from a mere description of the way things are. I got a call from a, uh, another homosexual. I don't get a lot of calls from homosexuals, but the ones that I do are memorable because they're good examples for the things that I'm talking about. He told me that he was a homosexual and that he um, wanted to know what I thought about it, and I gave him my opinion. and. He said, but, you know, you must be wrong about that because I was born this way. From the time I was real young, I remember having these desires. And every time I got around another male, I'd have this sensation and this desire and this impulse. And it's natural for me I was born that way. Now, what is his argument? His argument is essentially that if you're born with something naturally, then the, then the condition or the exercise of that thing turns out to be morally benign. He was drawing a moral conclusion based simply on the way things were, and that's called the naturalistic fallacy. Just because the things are a certain way, descriptively, doesn't mean they ought to be that way prescriptively from a moral perspective. And I pointed the problem out to him by offering, an, uh, by offering him this, um, this illustration. I said, Marty, his name is Marty. I said, Marty, what if I were to say to you, and I don't believe this, Marty, but what if I were to offer this to you? Unfortunately, I didn't hear the disclaimer. It created a problem. But I said, what if I were to say to you that I've had this desire since I was a little boy, the 
this particular desire. It pops up in certain situations. It's entirely natural to me. I've, uh, there's never been a time when I don't remember having it. Having it. I was born with it. And th this particular desire is every time that I see a homosexual, I want to beat his brains out. <laughs> well, Marty got real mad at me. And I said, Marty, I, I, wait, wait, wait. I don't believe that is good. I think that's wrong. My question is, how can you think it's wrong based on the justification for homosexuality that you just gave me? You see, if it is the case that a thing that is natural is therefore moral, then anything that's natural is therefore moral, including my gay bashing if, in fact, it turns out to be a natural thing for me. And you see, this illustration points out the problem with the naturalistic fallacy. You can't get an ought from an is, is the way David Hume put it. You can't get an ought from, an, uh, from a mere is. You cannot get an ought, a moral ought, from a mere is, I-S, David Hume. And it relates to the naturalistic fallacy. And one could say that's why the doing just what comes naturally argument of homosexuals is not going to work. I mean, let's face it, animals do what comes naturally. And one could say that the difference between just doing what comes naturally and principled self-restraint is what's called a civilization. That's the whole point. Living the moral life means that we don't just do what comes naturally, and therefore offering the naturalistic justification for something like homosexuality is not going to solve the moral problem. It's guilty of the naturalistic fallacy. Number six, self-refuting arguments. Some points of view don't need refutation. They do it all by themselves. You just um, point out the self-refuting nature of the argument and watch the, uh, the argument commit Harry Carey. Uh, this is uh, technically called... Um, well, self-refutation, self I call it suicide as a tactic. Uh, some are real simple, like the statement, there are no sentences longer than three words. You notice that the statement itself does not fulfill its own requirement for truthfulness, and therefore it's self-refuting. If there are no statements longer than three words, then that statement itself would have to be lower than, smaller than three words, wouldn't it? Or three words are, sh are shorter. But it's longer than three words, so if it's, if it's false, it's false. And if it's true, it's also false. It's self-refuting. There is no absolute truth. Are you sure? Absolutely. See how that works. Uh, this comes up a lot in moral issues. I mentioned earlier about the person who says, there is no morality, therefore it's wrong for you to push your morality on me. It's essentially saying there are no moral truths, and here's one. Well, if there are no moral truths, then there isn't the moral truth that we ought to be tolerant of other people. This came out once in a conversation with a, a young man named Gil, who was a, um, a physical therapist, and we'd been meeting over a couple of weeks to do some rehab, and I talked to him about Christianity as the weeks went on, and one, he's a real nice guy, but a uh, real tolerant type. But one day he um, asked about homosexuality, and, and it be became clear that, and the reason this homosexual issue comes up is it's a classic hot button right now, in, including in this state. And it was clear that I thought homosexuality was immoral. I tried to give some reasons, and he got real frustrated with me. He said, you know, you Christians are pretty nice people, but uh, before long you start getting judgmental. Now, I know there's a problem with what he just said, and I'm going to exploit the problem. His point of view commits suicide. It's self-refuting. I'm going to exploit the problem by asking him a simple question. I say, Gil, what's wrong with, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with me judging homosexuals? And his answer was, it's not right to judge. And so I said, then, Gil, why are you judging me? Huh? He stepped back for a minute. Scratching his chin, he's thinking, all right, wait a minute. Wait, this, guy, this guy's a hot one. I've got to be careful with this guy. And I was, all right. Mm -hmm. All right, I, I guess I was judging. There's no way I can get around that. All right. All right, here's the deal. You can judge. That's all right. As long as you don't push your morality on somebody else. Once you start pushing your morality on them, you cross the line. I said, okay, Gil, can I ask you a question? He said, yeah. I said, is that your morality, what you just told me just then? He said, yeah. Then why are you pushing it on me? Exactly right, see? 
There are no moral rules, and here's one. See how that works? Oh, I kind of like that. I better write that down. There are no, you can write that one too if you want. Moral rules, and here's one. So he drops back again. You know, he's stuck stonewalled there, and he's trying to figure out a way to make it work, and he finally gets real frustrated because he made a couple of false starts, and he wasn't going to get off the ground with this one. And he said, it's not fair. I said, what do you mean it's not fair? He said, I, I, I can't find a way to say it in which it sounds right. He thought I was playing a word game on him or something, you know, a trick. I said, well, Gil, it doesn't sound right because it's not right. It's self-refuting. And a lot of times I have people at this point that get frustrated, and they say, well, now you got me all confused. I said, no, uh, you were confused when you started. <laughs> uh, you just now figured that out, you see. So that's um, an example of a self-refuting argument. When the point of view doesn't satisfy its own requirements for truthfulness. Someone asked me about uh, positivism earlier at lunch. The view that uh, you can't hold anything, it's not rational to believe anything unless it's been proven by the scientific method. Here's my question. Is that point of view also been proven by the scientific method? And the answer is, of course, no, it hasn't been. Then according to its own standards, it's not worthy of being believed. It's self-refuting. The argument commits suicide. That's self-refuting arguments. Last one is the straw man fallacy. Straw man fallacy. Incidentally, uh, Dr. Frank Beckwith is a master at um, picking out a self-refuting argument. He's a lot of fun. If you, if you read some of his books or you see him in a debate or even when he's lecturing, he uses the tactic a lot. And um, he's really good at it. And you can be good at it too if you um, uh, familiarize yourself with the concept and then watch for them. Finally, straw man fallacy is misrepresenting a position and then defeating the caricature and not the real thing. Misrepresenting a position and then defeating the caricature and not the real thing. I heard um, a broadcast from D. James Kennedy recently. He has a little series on, um, on abortion, uh, against abortionists, and one of his arguments was that uh, most women... Uh, the, the, against the pro-choice position is that most women don't have the choice to get an abortion. They're forced into it by other people. Um, this is a good example of a straw man fallacy. I agree with the, the, the good doctor's point of view about abortion, but I don't think he's made a good point in this particular fashion. I think it is condemnable that women are forced into uh, to abortions, but that is not the pro-choice position. The pro-choice position isn't that women should be coerced by their boyfriends or their fathers or their husbands into getting abortions. The pro-choice position is that they should be allowed to have the choice. And so pointing this thing out is attacking something that isn't really the position in view. He means to be attack attacking the pro-choice position, but the pro-choicers would have the same objection that he has. So he finds himself in the unenviable position of giving a very good argument against a point of view that is not held by his opponents. And that's what happens when you have a straw man argument. And this, this um, comes up um, in many, many different situations. That was just one example of it. As a Christian, if you are going to take exception with another person's point of view, you better be really sure that you get their view accurately. Because if you don't, it's not, not only are you not going to have an impact for good, but you're going to get them mad, and that's even worse. We want to show respect for the people that we discuss with and argue with by making sure we get their view correct and then attacking the real McCoy instead of some caricature, some straw man that we construct and then easily knock over. That doesn't do our side any good. Now, I realize in the last four hours we've, we've covered a tremendous amount of material and you've been very, very patient. And apart from a few of you have drifted off into the arms of Morpheus while I've been speaking, uh, most of you have been really attentive, and that's been great. I want to encourage you about this material, though, because th there is a lot of stuff here that is very useful. This is not theoretical. These are things that I have developed and learned on the battlefield with real non-Christians and with professors and with lawyers and with doctors and with people who knew a thing or two. These things work. 
but they only work if you learn how to use them. And the best way to learn how to use them is to get out there and just start doing it. Begin to employ some of these things. Be thinking about them. Be talking about them. When you watch TV, when you read articles in the paper, try to see, ask yourself, what's the argument? What's going wrong here? Is this simple name calling? Is this relevant to the particular point? Or is it one of these distractions, like one of these fallacies, etc.? And when you do this, you will gain an ability to see things that you've never seen before. And I guarantee if you begin to make this a habit of your life in a few years, you'll be so good at this, you'll be like the armchair quarterback, except for you'll be really playing the game. And it'll be a game that really matters. And I commend you to that task in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you.